Hi, I'm Marty Kelsey, one of the hosts of STEM in 30, an Emmy-nominated TV show for middle school students produced by the National Air and Space Museum. And we've got a great show for you today. We are focusing this entire month on National History Day. The most recent episode of STEM in 30 came out last week and introduces you to some amazing people and how important communication is to them. This includes Gene Kranz, Margo Lee Shetterly, the author of Hidden Figures, and some athletes, including Robert Griffin III of the Baltimore Ravens, Craig Laughlin of the Washington Capitals, and two professional soccer players, Megan Oyster and Darian Jenkins. Uh, we'll put a link in the comments section for that show, and we encourage you to go check that out because it also looks at primary and secondary sources, as well as giving you some great resources for your National History Day projects. Before we get going today, remember that we want to know where you are watching from. If you're watching in a classroom, let us know, but we'll put that down in the comments section, and we'll be giving shout outs throughout the show today. And also, this is your program. The whole purpose of today is to answer your questions around National History Day. The theme this year is communication is the key to understanding. So we'll want to focus those questions on communication, but whatever you've got, put it in the comments section and we'll get to as many of them as we can. We've got a couple of great guests with us today. We'll be, we're going to be joined by Dr. Jennifer Lavasser, Dr. Teasel Muir Harmony, and Jim David, all curators in the Space History Department at the National Air and Space Museum. Welcome, everybody. Hey, Marty. Thank you. Good afternoon. All right, so to get us started and so that everybody kind of knows what we're talking about today, um, I'm just gonna have each of you tell us what your level, what your um, area of expertise at the museum. Jennifer, let's start with you. Yeah, uh, thanks Marty and hi everybody. Uh, I am a huge supporter of National History Day as a, as a judge for a number of years at the national competition level. So I'm really excited to get to talk to everybody today. I am the museum's curator for the Space Shuttle and International Space Station. That's what I curate, but what I do research on is visual communication. Uh, I, my recent book was about how astronauts of the Apollo era communicated uh, using photography about what their experiences were. So while that's my research on the, the one side, my collection is probably what makes it is a little more visible to all of the folks at home. All right, Jim, how about you? Good afternoon, and I guess for some of you, uh, far west of here, good morning. Uh, as uh, Marty said, uh, my name is Jim David, and I'm responsible for what we call military space systems, satellites in orbit around the Earth that the military uses, and some programs on the land or in the sea related to use of space by the military. And that also includes communication satellites that are used by the military to communicate with members of the military around the world, whether they're on the oceans or on land or in airplanes in the atmosphere. Awesome. And Teasel, how about you? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm responsible for the Apollo collection at the Air and Space Museum, as well as the Skylab and Apollo Soyuz test project collections. And um, in my research, I write about Apollo and space diplomacy, um, and I look at public relations and propaganda. All right, well, we've already got a bunch of folks tuning in. We've got Texas, uh, Lackawanna, North Carolina, homeschool family from Detroit, William Jake Shallop from New Jersey, Indiana, Delaware, Florida, New York, Ohio, Montana, Philly, Mrs. S's sixth grade class from Camelot Elementary School in Annandale, Virginia, Whitford Academy in Rhode Island, and uh, uh, middle school in uh, Alabama. Thank you all so much for tuning in today. Um, to get us started, because we are really focused on National History Day, I want to kind of start out by asking you all, how important are primary sources to the research that you do? Jennifer? Well, that's really what a historian's work is based on. I, over you know, um, the years, I have sort of expanded my understanding of primary resources. Um, that's something that I, as part of my research, was wanting to do more of because I think what historians have traditionally used as primary resources are written materials. And so you go into an archive at a university or some other location, a federal records center, for example, the National Archives, 
and you see boxes and boxes and boxes of printed material. And obviously over many, many, many years, leading up to really recent decades, we generated a heck of a lot of paper material, memoranda, meeting minutes, um, notes, summaries, studies, all kinds of material. And that's all stashed away in people's files and, and on a gut Jim is a great person to speak about sort of what that means on for the federal government system. But on the other side of that, people save that material and then it can go into an archive. So in many instances, we're using archival material, um, documents, things that really trace a storyline at a particular location or at a specific point in time. Things like letters, um, oftentimes books are written about the letters between two people or letters and records that individuals have kept. And so in my case, I was more interested in visual documentation. So not written documentation necessarily, but the actual photographs that astronauts took. And so primary sources can take on a number of different forms. And so that's why I always encourage students uh, especially working on National History Day projects, to think outside the box, literally. Um, you don't have to just look at a box of archival records. There's lots of other different types of, types of archival material that you can draw on, uh, including newspaper materials, newspaper articles, uh, and so on. So it's a really rich set of resources that are out there um, if you want to consider the breadth of primary resource material. And one of the segments that's in the most recent episode of STEM in 30, um, Jennifer kicks it off and then hands it off to Tom Crouch, uh, curator emeritus, who goes into a deep dive into that very famous first flight photo and really talks about the things that you can see there. So if you want to learn more about that, be sure to check out the latest episode. And next week, we're talking about aviation history. So be sure to tune in there as well. And don't forget to put your questions in the comments section. Now, Jim, you deal with uh, primary sources as well, but some of them are classified, right? Uh, that's correct. Uh, it, at times, actually quite frequently, I have a lot of difficulty accessing the records of the government, whether it's the Department of Defense or some other agency whose records I'm, I'm interested in. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the, the relevant agencies do release materials, uh, sometimes voluntarily, sometimes at my request or at the request of another researcher. But I would like to emphasize a point that uh, Jennifer made, uh, and that is that the federal government's records come in all forms. Of course, for many years, they were mostly paper. Uh, but there were still photographs, films, videos, audio recordings, uh, maps, charts, uh, records in those different formats. And of course, in the last several decades, uh, a lot of federal agencies, as with uh, other governments and, and um, uh, individuals uh, and businesses, are keeping their records electronically. And, and access to those uh, poses uh, real problems. But uh, there are all sorts of primary resources besides federal government records. Uh, there are um, newspaper articles, there are magazine articles, there are good books, um, uh, and, and it's fun. It can take an awful lot of time, but it's fun trying to figure out, well, where do I want to look to find out something about this topic? Um, but you put, uh, as we say, your nose to the grindstone, you map out where you want to go, and you get started. Jim, I love that you talked about it being fun, because I, I do think these National History Day projects can be a lot of fun to really do a deep dive into a topic. Teasel, can you talk a little bit about a primary source that kids may not think about a lot of times, and that's the objects in a museum? Sure. Um, it's it's one of the primary sources that we don't always think of. I think we usually we usually go to um, documents, paper documents, um, and maybe even photographs or film. But artifacts can also provide you a lot of information about um, a time you're studying and give you a sense of of what it was like to um, to experience or be part of a certain moment in history. And one of the um, 
types of artifacts that I find really helpful at the museum um, to look at and think about are the spacecraft and especially um, from the Mercury program, these very, very small spacecraft that that house just one astronaut um, on these shorter missions. And you really get a good sense for um, when it was developed, the technology that was available, what it was like to be an astronaut at that time, climbing into that type of spacecraft. And so there's a lot of information that you can gain from objects themselves. Uh, I wrote a book about it. Um, uh, on the Apollo program and choosing 50 artifacts from the Smithsonian's collection that help tell that story. And um, some of them are really, really revealing. One of my favorites is the urine collection device. <laughs> and it might be an odd one to pick as a favorite, but one of the things that, that I really like about it is it's very clear that it's designed for men's bodies alone, only men's bodies. And that tells you a bit about um, the, the early American um, spaceflight program. And they're only allowed uh, male astronauts to fly in space. And so the urine collection device is, is um, some of the evidence of that moment and that decision to only allow men to go into space at that time. Really interesting, the stories that those objects can tell. We've got the Netherlands, Germany, and South Africa tuning in, as well as West Virginia, Kansas City, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, New York, New Jersey, Ohio, Nebraska, Massachusetts, Maryland, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and California, as well as Mrs. Davis's sixth grade class, uh, Camelot Elementary School and some homeschoolers in Delaware. I'm also getting a note that we've got a lot of folks submitting questions based on their National, Hi National History Day projects. Keep those coming in. We want to get to as many of them as we can. Um, Jennifer, we've got a question that I think it will be right in your wheelhouse. How <laughs> has photography played a role in how we're able to understand space history? Well, it plays a huge role. I mean, it is, if you think about your daily life, and this is what we often talk about in trying to think about what astronaut experience is like is, and especially during the pandemic, it's been actually kind of an easy um, connection to make is that, you know, you, if you have a phone, if you have a tablet, if you have some kind of a camera, you know, you might document say a trip to the beach or a trip to go camping. And that then locks in a memory of a moment in time. And for astronauts that takes on lots of different dimensions. And so those cameras that they use are really invaluable into documenting their work, documenting their experience and providing that information when they return home or as is possible now transmitting those images back to earth uh, electronically. So those then become these sort of really important documents of their own. And I use usually in, in my research particular examples like uh, the Apollo 13 mission, where the only, the only way for astronauts to provide information back to folks on the ground about what happened to their spacecraft was to describe it in words and to take photographs. And that's true of all the experiences on the moon and during those voyages is there were a very limited number of people experiencing this. And that's still true for space flight. Uh, it may be changing with all of the exciting activity going on, but for Apollo 13 in particular, this was an incredibly important moment for engineers to be able to uncover the um, the mishap, what is it that went wrong with that spacecraft? And so the astronauts took photographs as they were returning to Earth and they abandoned the service module of the spacecraft. They were able to turn their cameras on that damage and document all of it and then have it studied once it came uh, once that film came back to Earth. And so as a sort of engineering study, that's where they got that information. And that's true of spaceflight and has been all along, is that it's really important to be able to document all of this. Because if you watch a launch today, and we had a launch today with Blue Origin, um, but watching and, and, and really um, documenting all that stuff visually allows people to go back and study if something goes wrong, where did it go wrong? Could we have seen something with our eyes? Um, was there something that our electric systems, all of those systems that are built in to really keep an eye on the spacecraft, did something fail in that whole process? And so the visuals become really crucial um, if something does go wrong. And, um, and if they go right, which is often the instance, more often the instance that things go right, they can be really celebratory. So astronauts love to take pictures of themselves doing things on the International Space Station. Um, we really get to see the work of the astronauts, the lives of the astronauts, what it really looks like. We can get a sense of what it feels like. And so with astronauts handling objects that we can understand, whether it be a tool 
or a computer or a freezer or whatever it might be, even plants now, um, we can kind of get a sense of how that life is different than our own. And so it becomes, um, and sometimes how it's the same as our own, whether you're looking, you know, you're celebrating a holiday as they like to do or eating a meal. It's really those photographs that just like it would for you and me kind of mark a moment in time and really are um, just a way to remember it and also share it. I, I look at those pictures with all the wires and the equipment, and everything all over the place. And I think I tripped walking through the living room earlier because there was a puzzle on the floor. I can't imagine how tangled I would be going through, a you know, floating through a module like that. Absolutely. Um, it is it is a messy place. And that's the thing. I think we get used to seeing space communicated from Hollywood as this very clean, sleek looking thing. But really, when you look at space and activity in space, it is incredibly messy. It is, um, it, you know, it is just it's an adventure and they're subject to some of the same problems that we are, including, you know, how to keep wire bundles of wires out of the way or where do you put your computer when you're not using it or, um, you know, they, they've got some of the same problems. And that's kind of the cool part of getting to see these pictures is that you really can't understand a little bit about what they're going through. We had an astronaut uh, tell us about a friend of his on the station that let go of an iPad and they found it six months later. So um, yeah, the, the hazards of working in space. Teasel, we've got a question here. Um, we all know the, the movie Apollo 18 is a work of fiction. That being said, I've heard that Apollo 18 was originally planned. Why did the Apro Apollo program end early? Well, um, there was Apollo 18 was planned um, and then a few additional missions after that, uh, at least initially, but it was an extremely expensive program. Um, uh, by the mid 1960s, it was over 4% of the federal budget. And at the time, the total cost of the program was about $25 billion. So it was very, very expensive. And um, uh, by by around 1969, 1970, um, there were a lot of discussions both at NASA and within the Nixon administration about cutting costs and redirecting um, the, the agency's focus. And so they um, decided to pursue things like the shuttle program instead. Okay. We've got uh, homeschoolers in Arkansas tuning in as well as uh, Canada, the Ukraine, Norway, the United Kingdom, New Mexico, Nashville, and California. Thank you all for tuning in today. And please put those questions down in the comments section. We're going to get to as many of them as we can. Uh, Jim, I've got a question for you. Um, before satellites took digital images, how did they communicate what they were finding back to Earth? Uh, before uh, digital imagery was acquired in space, uh, mostly by satellites and spacecraft without people. Uh, of course, throughout uh, the space age, most of the satellites and spacecraft that have been launched um, and have operated uh, in orbit around the Earth uh, have not carried people. They're what we call robotic or automatic satellites. Um, the imagery acquired in the first couple of decades, uh, both by astronauts and of course, Soviet astronauts, which were called cosmonauts, uh, but uh, also by what we call robotic or automatic satellites. Uh, much of it was acquired using a, a camera and film. Uh, a lot of the folks listening today probably aren't familiar with film. It's not used that much in photography, uh, whether it's, it's certainly not used in photography from satellites anymore, but people on the earth, they have their cameras and, and iPhones and things like that. And none of those items use film anymore. Um, but it, uh, it was used, uh, both by astronauts and Soviet cosmonauts, and more importantly, by all sorts of satellites taking pictures of the Earth. And that meant that uh, after uh, all the film was used, it had to be returned to Earth. Well, when you're talking astronauts and cosmonauts, when they return to Earth, they bring the film from their cameras back with them but other types of satellites uh, would put their film that had been exposed 
in picture taking in capsules and those capsules would return to earth and they would be recovered either by aircraft or uh, if they happened to land uh, in the ocean uh, by ships. Um, with all that said, even from the earliest days, there were some satellites that carried uh, cameras that did not use film and returned their imagery electronically to Earth. For example, uh, the weather satellites that NASA pioneered in 1960. They didn't carry camera and film, they carried a type of camera that took images of, of cloud formations and so on and so forth. And it returned the imagery or photography to Earth electronically, uh, but it was only useful for that purpose. Uh, features really couldn't be distinguished in the photography from these early weather satellites, for example. So you really couldn't detect airfields or things of that nature. The photography was of, of a quality that it could only really be used for the study of, of weather. We've got and in, in, in the 1970s, uh, basically all types of satellites started moving to uh, returning their imagery electronically and the imagery became very, very high quality. Yeah, we've, we've come a long way since then. Um, absolutely, absolutely. All right, I've got a question that I'd like to pose to all three of you because I, I'd like to see what, what different thoughts you have on it. We've gotten a bunch of questions that have come in about the space race and about Sputnik in particular, but really focused on how did the space race and Sputnik, how did those change education in this country? And I think that's a really interesting, interesting question. Anybody want to start us off? Uh, I'll, I'll just say it, it was a, the event, which of course took place in October 1957, uh, was a, a real shock to the American public. It really wasn't a surprise to certain parts of the American government that had an inkling that the Soviet Union sooner or later was going to launch the first artificial or human-made satellite. But it was a great shock to the American public. Uh, a lot of politicians uh, got a bandwagon moving that we were far behind the Soviet Union in the race to utilize space, the race to get into space, uh, both with people and with, as I mentioned, robotic or automatic satellites. And as I understand it, one of the projects or initiatives that resulted from this uh, uh, debate and, and focus on, on the huge, and it was a huge accomplishment by the Soviet Union, was we need to focus our education system more on math and engineering, what we call today STEM. So as I understand it, uh, even starting in the elementary schools, there was uh, more emphasis on uh, math and science, and that carried through uh, all the way through college and, and graduate programs. We needed more mathematicians and engineers and folks like that that could compete with the Soviet Union in this new arena. Yep. All right, uh, Jennifer and Teasel, somebody wants to know, are there any high quality scans of the original Hasselblad camera film from the Apollo Lunar EVAs? And it, it, if, if you all have a link, you can send it to me and we'll put it into the, into the chat later. Where would somebody go to get those high quality images? Oh, I'm happy to provide that. That's one of my favorite things, obviously, to talk about is Apollo imagery. And so um, while those um, flight films were originally uh, basically, when the films came back, would be um, per, uh, you know actually uh, developed in Houston. Those films would then be copied and distributed, and those are called masters. And so, those first generation masters then were the masters for second generation masters. But the original flight films have, in the last um, well recent years, I would say the last decade and a half or so, 
been rescanned uh, at high quality in order for people to have accessible, you know, access to those digitally. And so there is a a project that was done in conjunction, um, well, as a as a sort of partnership between NASA and Arizona State University. And if you just Google the um, title of the project called March to the Moon, um, and we can give, uh, I'll send that link over shortly, um, but that website provides you with mission by mission options of looking at each of those. And you can actually take those images and, and, and download them in different sizes. Um, and because they are images from NASA, they are public resources, which means you don't need to pay to use them. And that's one of the things that I think is common to the resources that Teasel and Jim and I all use is that we're largely drawing on government materials uh, for some of what we do. And uh, that's a, that's a, there's a, a big difference there between the accessibility of government records and government materials versus private records and private materials. It can be much more challenging to access things that are not collected by the government and made by the government. So as taxpayers, we all have access to those materials free of charge. Um, when you use an image, however, it's nice to always credit your source. And in this case, you just want to say that the image credit was NASA. Um, so I will um, we'll make sure we get that link in the chat. That is one of many NASA resources. However, if you want something that's a little lower quality, uh, NASA has an images website that is simply images.nasa.gov. There you can use all kinds of search terms to find what you're looking for. And then they also have um, a Flickr website where you can see some of the most recent images taken on the International Space Station, which is always fun too. And I, I love looking can I, through the, oh, go ahead, Teal. I was just going to add, there's a, there's another source that could be uh, um, of interest and relevance, which is the Apollo Lunar Surface Journal and uh, Apollo Flight Journal. And they're great websites because you can, um, they're full uh, transcripts of the mission and you can see when certain images were taken in, in the sequencing of the mission. And so if you're interested in a particular image from the surface of the moon and you want to know at what point did the astronauts take it, what else were they doing at the time, what were they saying to each other, um, that's a great resource as well. And I will work with uh, Jennifer and Teasel and Jim when the program's over today, and we will get those and we'll put them in the comments section. Also follow STEM and 30 on Facebook and Twitter, and we'll we'll uh, tweet those resources out as well. Um, Marty, I, I, I was just going to add uh, a quick comment, and uh, if if I can, and that is uh, uh, for those interested in pictures of the Earth, the oceans. Uh, the, the cloud formations, volcanoes, fires, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, the NASA and then uh, the National Ocean uh, Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration websites are very, very good sources. Um, I understand from what Marty has said that there are a lot of uh, folks watching this broadcast from foreign nations. And a lot of foreign nations uh, have satellites uh, that take pictures of the Earth for weather purposes and, and all sorts of other purposes. And so uh, there are resources on the web. Uh, for example, uh, Indian Space Research uh, Organization, uh, the Japanese Space Development Agency, uh, uh, Airbus and other European satellite operators, and all these websites have great imagery of the Earth. And all this imagery has been taken for a reason, to uh, provide scientists and others with information on something, whether it's a volcano erupting or it's a hurricane moving across the Atlantic Ocean that may hit the Caribbean and Florida or Georgia or South Carolina, uh, or any number of other reasons. And then let me also mention that uh, in the last 20 or 30 years, a lot of private companies around the world, uh, U.S., Canadian, European, uh, and, and so on, uh, have been flying their own satellites, which is a big, big change from 50, 60 years ago. Um, and, and a lot of those satellites, not all of them, but a lot of them take pictures of the earth 
and they sell them to various people, governments and businesses, and in some cases, individuals. And so companies like Maxar here in the United States, Airbus in Europe, and uh, Planet Labs here in the United States, uh, ISI uh, in Finland, and so on. Those are great resources and very easy for uh, people to, to access representative imagery. And, and you can see what all these different types of satellites from all these different countries and all these now, all these different companies, what they're doing up there. And one of our former colleagues used uh, satellite imagery to look at urban tree cover around Washington, D.C., which I always thought was a really um, interesting topic. We've got Mr. Batar's sixth grade class, and uh, and I'm going to mess this up, Mrs. Villa Lobo's sixth grade class from Arizona. Hopefully I got that right. Thank you all for tuning in. Um, hopefully you guys are doing awesome work on your um uh, National History Day project. Uh, we've got a few minutes left. Another question uh, from Mr. Batari, sixth grade class wants to know, are the Apollo missions the most expensive missions that we've had or was the shuttle more expensive than Apollo? Well, uh, speaking for the shuttle program at nearly $400 million per launch over the course of 135 launches, uh, I think in totality, the shuttle mission, because of its length, because of the research and development, um, and just an incredible number of um, other other costs involved, would probably be considered that by uh, some some distance, perhaps. Um, Teasel quoted a number earlier in terms of the cost of the Apollo program. So I don't think I've ever run the numbers, but my presumption would be because the shuttle program lasted for 30 years, um, you know, there's not really much of a comparison there. Um, but, you know, as we're finding with missions that are now, you know, sort of, re you know, we're re-emerging uh, in terms of going back to the moon, uh, the costs are high. Um, and how much is the government willing to put towards going back to the moon versus, um, you know, some of the things, and these are the same challenges that were faced in the 1970s, like Teasel mentioned, you know, things were redirected from NASA's budget to other places. We may be facing the same challenge here in the coming years um, where we make different decisions than say the last four to eight years or even 12 years in terms of funding for space flight. Um, it may need to be redirected to other activities because those are just more of greater concern and um, you know, certainly greater concern to the public at home rather than going back to the moon. And um, that's where the real difficulty has of course been in the last number of decades in terms of the value of space flight. What do we get out of it um, in order to justify it? So can we justify that expense um, with what's learned in space. And so we get that question a lot at the museum, sort of what's the value? What is the, what are we getting from all of this? And that's a um, a bit of a challenging question to answer when, as you know, um, Teasel's not the rocket, your rocketry curator, nor am I. Um, and so I can't describe some of these things either, but I'm also not an economist. And so it, it makes it really challenging to sort of place all of this in a sort of grander scheme of, you know, what is, what is important or um, valuable or useful at any one time. And that's sort of a judgment call. Okay. I, I, I was Go just going to add in relationship to that. So recent estimates suggest that the entire lunar effort in the 1960s, so that includes the Gemini program, uh, is about $280 billion today, roughly. So uh, when you consider inflation, all those costs together, uh, it's actually just an, an extraordinary expense. And this is from 1961 through um, 1972. So quite expensive. Um, and as I said, over 4% of the federal budget. Um, and for many years, the NASA budget has been la less than half a percent of federal budget. But as Jennifer was mentioning, some of these programs last longer than others. Um, and I think the estimates for the Artemis program are somewhere between 20 and 30 billion in today's dollars. So much, much less expensive than Apollo. Wow. And Teasel, we're talking about communication. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, we're used to seeing real-time events happening in space. You know, a, a few weeks ago, we talked to an astronaut live from the International Space Station, but there were actually times during the Apollo missions when they were completely out of communication. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, sure. So um, 
when when astronauts go behind the moon, they're they're out of communication with the Earth, um, and the same would be true today, unless unless they were able to set up um, a satellite system around the moon to um, to deal with uh, communications there. Uh, but um, it was a brand new thing. One thing I should mention with the first lunar landing, um, it was a truly live global television broadcast. And at that time, that was very unprecedented. Um, you had uh, half the world's population following the flight in real time. Um, and that was part of the significance of the first lunar landing and, and the experience of it and sort of what the legacy of that that um, that, that mission and that accomplishment was. Um, and the estimates suggest about 500 to 600 billion people were watching it on television sets in the United States. It was over 90 percent of people with um televisions in their household were watching the mission. So um, it was it was really unprecedented in scale and it required a big, extensive, complicated communication system. Um, so ground stations, um, the tracking network, satellites, um, and then also uh, lots of innovations and communications on the spacecraft themselves. That is amazing. amazing. Yeah, go ahead, Jim. Uh, I was just going to mention something quickly and that is uh, there's different kinds of spacecraft, of course, that go into space. And one of them is the type that carries humans. But uh, uh, again, there's the, the vast majority of, of spacecraft don't carry humans. They carry cameras and they carry other sorts of instruments and equipment. Uh, and, and so, uh, for the most part, uh, there's no moves underway to reduce those programs. For example, probably most of our uh, listeners today are familiar with GPS or some foreign navigation satellite system. Uh, the Russians, the Chinese, and the Europeans also have global uh, navigation satellite systems. And, uh, th and, and there's great demand uh, around the world for the signals that uh, these satellites provide. And, and actually, it, it, this may be something new for many of our listeners. Uh, the GPS satellites in their 31 in orbit around the Earth, uh, those are Air Force satellites. And so the Air Force has spent tens and tens of billions of dollars beginning in the late 1970s on this system. And they are launching uh, greatly improved satellites uh, uh, beginning about uh, oh, a year or two ago uh, to replace all the ones in, in orbit. Uh, and there is no plans whatsoever uh, to reduce that program. It's the same with weather satellites around the world. And I know and, that I would be lost if I didn't have my GPS, you know, in my pocket with me and able to look up the forecast each morning. Well, we're just I, about I, I have time. never used it, so <laughs> <laughs> I still like a map. <laughs> there you go. Well, we're just about out of time, but we had uh, a couple of questions come in. One from uh, Mrs. Villa Lobo's sixth grade class in Sierra Vista, Arizona, and they want to know, how do you become a space historian? <laughs> well, I, I was speaking for myself, I think we can all share a different story, but very briefly, um, what I can say is um, I, you know, had a passing fascination with spaceflight as a kid. And um, I still tell my own children today, I never would have imagined back then when I was watching shuttle launches that I would end up in the position I'm in today to be a shuttle curator. Um, it, is, it is not what I imagined for myself, but it is really the most, one of the most satisfying um, things to be able to do. I work with amazing people who inspired me. Um, I started work at the museum over 18 years ago, just really as a sort of budding historian, not even somebody who thought necessarily they'd be a historian. Um, but I worked with people like Jim. Jim's been um, at the museum longer than I have, and people like Jim and others inspired me in my department to really think about what it is I wanted to do. Uh, I wanted to be a curator. My real passion is for the artifacts. Um, as historical tools and uh, for us to understand, like Tisa was talking about, study them 
as documents. And so because I got an exposure to the artifact collection at the museum, it really inspired me to then go the extra mile and, and get a PhD. But um, I've known Teasel for almost as long as that. Teasel started out as an intern at the museum around the same time that I started out my job. And so I think we all like have a different pathway to today, but um, I think it's really the passion for understanding these narratives about the past and, um, you know, just um, a real, like Jim said, we have fun looking at this material and then communicating it to the public through our exhibits, through our research. Um, so we all write articles and books and blog posts and go to conferences and things like that. Um, but, you know, it is a passion for sure. Um, it's not, I, I often tell our interns, it is not the most profitable career path that you could choose. That you will not become a millionaire unless you, you know, privately write really successful books about history. Um, but it is something that you really invest your, your heart into in a lot of ways. And Jim, how about you? How'd you end up studying space history? I, I basically started almost in an intern position. Uh, I had had a prior career in another field, and I just got to love it very, very quickly. Uh, let me just echo or repeat what Jennifer and uh, uh, Teasel have said about uh, uh, the passion. Uh, it doesn't matter what field you go into, whether it's medicine uh, or finance or any other field, the uh, passion is needed, but passion is very, very important in this field. Uh, and, and the thirst or the quench for knowledge. I want to find out about this subject and I want to tell other people, whether it's in a television program or writing an article or writing a book or a blog post or any number of other things about what I've learned. Um, uh, there are many ways to uh, convey the, the knowledge that that you've gained and acquired. Um, and, and let me just say, there's a lot of space historians outside of the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. Some of them work for the government, uh, and not only here, but in foreign countries too, because again, lots of foreign countries uh, launch and, and operate satellites. Uh, some of them work for uh, companies, uh, Lockheed, Northrop Grumman, so on and so forth. And then, of course, there are some that are at uh, universities and in colleges. So it's uh, there are space historians uh, and lots of places uh, far beyond uh, the National Air and Space Museum. And if you're watching this broadcast today and, and you pursue that, we would love for you to come work with us at the museum. Uh, we're always looking for awesome people. Well, Jennifer, Teasel, Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate you guys answering these questions. And before we leave you, I do want to share a few additional resources that may help you with some National History Day projects. Uh, you can search the National Air and Space Museum archive collection using SOVA, the Smithsonian Online Virtual Archives. You can search Smithsonian collections of personal papers, manuscripts, photographs, oral histories, films, works of art, and organizational records. Look for the little blue box icon to find digitized materials. You can also learn more about aircraft and spacecraft, equipment, art, memorabilia in the museum's collection by searching our artifacts. And for both of these, we'll add links down into the comments section, or again, follow STEM and 30 on Facebook and Twitter. Also, STEM and 30 just released an entire episode on the importance of communication that includes historical figures, authors, and even athletes. We encourage you to check that out. And next week, we are really excited about our live chat. Um, we're going to be having uh, an aviation history chat. We'll be joined by Dr. Peter J Jacob, an expert on early aviation, and Heather Wilson, who was not only a member of Congress, but was also the 24th Secretary of the Air Force. And on January 28th, we'll be having another National History Day live chat. And that topic we are still working to confirm our guests on, but it is going to be really, really interesting. And we hope that you can all tune in. Um, and though, even though this isn't National History Day related, we want to let everyone know about a great series of programs happening this weekend. Soar Together Family Day programming includes author talks, virtual scavenger hunts, all on the theme of science fiction. So head over to the museum's webpage to learn more. 
And from me and everybody at the museum, we wish you luck on your National History Day projects, and we appreciate you watching today. Take care.